Hey, welcome to today's video. Uh, today we're taking a look at uh, the splinter net. Specifically, what is the splinter net? Uh, and this is sort of a global concept that's uh, impacting the internet as we know it right now. Uh, so I'm Richard Chapo. I'm an internet lawyer uh, in San Diego, California, and I've been advising online businesses for about the past 20 years. So the splinter net, what is it? Well, to understand, we need to step back a little bit in time. Uh, we go to the late 1990s and we had a group that, uh, well, I call them the utopians. And these were the people that were looking at the future of the internet and they decided that, um, hey, you know, this thing may, may be the answer we've looked for for humanity. Maybe it will be the thing that unites humanity across the world. Well, the free flow of information and communication between people will drop all of our you know negative characteristics Everybody will join hands. It'll be kumbaya. We'll all ride unicorns across the digital fields under digital rainbows. Uh, I make light of them, but, uh, uh, you know, to some extent they were right. Um, for the first time in the history of humanity, we had the ability to have people uh, just communicate with each other regardless of where they were located and regardless of what governments may or may not have wanted them to be uh, talking about. Uh, so, you know, I'm a big hockey fan. I'm a fan of the Los Angeles Kings hockey team, and they are awful this year. Um, but nonetheless, there are forums uh, and boards online uh, where Kings fans can congregate, and, uh, you know, you can go on there, and there are fans from all across the world. And so uh, because of the Internet, you know, I can read uh, somebody's opinion on how to fix the team. Uh, that person may be located in Norway. And I can uh, place a comment uh, under their opinion, insulting them. And, uh, you know, they can respond in kind with an insult and off we go. See, utopia. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it is pretty amazing. Uh, before the Internet, you know, obviously that could not happen. Uh, and people, you know, the Internet is so ingrained into our life now that it's easy to forget that. Prior to the Internet as a commercial medium, you know, we were very uh, locally oriented. Uh, you really only communicated with people in your area. You know, maybe you subscribe to a newspaper from another city, maybe a major newspaper. Um, but the information, uh, the goods, the services that you had access access to were almost all local. And so that led to, um, frankly, uh, situations where uh, nefarious groups could really uh, control maybe the ideas that you were exposed to. And then, of course, on a more serious level, you know, we've seen the Internet uh, have an impact even in, you know, the overthrow of uh, oppressive governments, you know, situations like the Arab Spring. And so that's pretty amazing. And in that sense, there is little doubt that the Internet has radically changed uh, our society uh, and, you know, humanity as a whole. And so in that sense, it's to be applauded. Now, in the late 1990s, there was another group who was also looking at uh, the future of the internet and uh, they weren't quite as uh, optimistic as the utopians. <laughs> uh, and these were uh, the origins of the splinter net. It wasn't called the splinter net back then. Um, but the problem was these group was looking around at the history of humanity and the way that we had divided ourselves um, you know, geographically and by ideas and theories and concepts and what have you. And there was some suggestion that, Hmm, you know, why would the internet be any different? Uh, and so uh, this is where we get the concept of the splinter net. The basic idea with the splinter net is that uh, this worldwide internet thing that we have will effectively be splintered into groups. And the splintering may be based on anything from uh, the advancement of tech, where first world countries have much more advanced tech than, uh, say, third world countries, maybe political agendas, um, even relig religious situations where you might have countries um, you know, that are, you know, very religiously oriented, like Iran, something like that, um, where they're going to limit, you know, the flow of information, um, you know, to a variety of different things. There's really no, um, cap on the different ways it could be divided. Um, now the problem with that is that you would eventually end up with an internet that was basically, uh, not one giant, uh, sphere, if you will. Instead, we would have a bunch of sub spheres and, uh, the isolation of information, uh, goods and services. It's not just economic. It would be the flow of information as well. Um, because I know everybody says, well, but you'll always be able to communicate, you know, over Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but keep in mind that these sites are, uh, private companies. And so they have to comply with these rules and regulations. And if they decide to stop servicing an area, well, um, that's their choice and they have every right to do that. And we see this in some, you know, some instances now Russia has a rule or a law that says if you collect personal information from their um, citizens, you have to maintain servers in Russia that contain all that information. 
you can play the ominous noise behind that. Uh, and Google and Yahoo and what have you have, of course, capitulated and agreed to that. But a site like LinkedIn did not. And so you cannot access LinkedIn in Russia. Uh, I'm not sure if that's still the case. It was at least a couple of years ago. Uh, LinkedIn was purchased by Microsoft, so I'm not exactly sure where they stand at this point. But nonetheless, we have seen those acts in the past. Uh, and so if you fast forward to uh, from the late 1990s to where we are now, uh, we're in kind of what I call the Empire Strikes Back uh, period of the Internet. And we're seeing governments and uh, economic unions, such as the EU, um, stepping forth and kind of marking their territory online. This is causing problems, much as it does in the real world when you have borders. So let's look at an example. Uh, the United States is unique in that um, privacy here is a bit of a joke. Now, if you're a citizen in the U.S., that might surprise you. Uh, but privacy isn't mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, some courts have interpreted a privacy right existing there um, you know, as a basis for certain rulings in controversial cases and controversial areas such as abortion, which we're not touching with a 10-foot pole. Um, but we don't actually have an expression uh, of an exact word privacy in the Constitution. We also don't have a general national privacy law. And we're one of the few first world com countries that doesn't. Uh, and it's kind of shocking that in 2019, <laughs> that's the case. Now, we do have some national privacy laws that are focused on either specific information or a specific group of people. So we have something called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And uh, it says if you're going to collect information from kids online who are under 19, then or under 19, under 13, then uh, you have to have verified parental consent. Uh, we also have you know, national privacy law on something like health records. Um, so there are a few out there that are uh, specifically oriented, but there's no general national privacy law. So if you're a company in the U.S., particularly an online company, and you go to create a privacy policy, eh, it's not very difficult. It's pretty short. Um, you're going to give out the basic information. You know, what's the information we collect from you? What do we do with it? How do we secure it? And who do we share it with? It depends on the state you're in, but that's the basic idea. Now, we are seeing a little bit more restrictive uh, privacy laws coming out, particularly in California, but that's not until 2020. Um, but even then, the U.S. market is is a very low reg, uh, if you will, on the privacy issue. Now, if we switch over to the EU, privacy is part of their charter. It's considered a human right. So it carries the value of, uh, say, the freedom of speech here in the U.S. So it has a lot of weight, and they pass rules and regulations uh, that are very restrictive. And frankly, they're a little out of control, to be honest. Uh, and a recent example of this was the GDPR. It went into effect in May 2018. And this regulation said that if you're going to collect personal data from individuals in the European Union, you have to have a legal basis for doing so. And there are six different legal bases. And then there are 99 articles that you have to wind your way through. Um, not all of them. Um, some of them are voted, devoted to the government, but there's a lot of them. And then on top of that, there's 230 plus recitals which I try to uh, further explain what's required in the articles. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, each of the member states of the EU, and we'll just pretend the UK is still there for now, uh, they are, have each passed their own law indicating how they are interpreting the GDPR and, and uh, you know, setting certain uh, parameters within it. Uh, and then each of those 28 member states has a supervisory authority, which is basically the enforcement agency. They've issued further guidance on how they want to see the GDPR complied with by companies. And so you have a, um, <laughs> a market where privacy is a nightmare to deal with for companies. It really is. It's just, uh, whereas the U.S. is under-regulated, the uh, EU is so over-regulated that even companies who are doing their best to comply don't honestly know if they're in compliance. There are certain aspects of the GDPR that are so vague and so poorly written that nobody's really sure what they mean. And that's pretty maddening. Um, so, But you can see the layers of complexity that are built up there and how difficult it could be to comply with it. Now, I'll give you an example. It even gets worse. Um, so uh, Article 8 of the uh, GDPR uh, deals with the collection of personal information from children online or offline. And it was modeled after the uh, Children's uh, Online Privacy Protection Act in the U.S., which says if you collect information from kids under 13 uh, online, you have to first have verified parental consent. And that was basically what Article 8 said. And it set the age at under 13. And it remained the same through every single draft of the GDPR for four years. And then when the final draft came up, 
the draft that was going to be voted on one month before the vote, somebody changed the age to under 16. <laughs> and uh, this caused all kinds of blowback, and you can understand why. Think of all the sites out there that uh, deal with teens or deal with, um, you know, kids. How do they tell the difference between uh, somebody who's 15 and somebody who's 16? Because the EU didn't previously have any rule on this. There was no age cutoff or anything. And so when you, most companies, their answer was to just comply with the U.S. law and focus on under 13. So if you have a website that maybe is a you know gaming website or something, and you have a form, how do you figure out who on your form is 15 versus 16 versus you know 14, 13, whatever? Um, Facebook, 2.2 billion accounts. How many of those accounts do you think are um, run or owned or opened by 15-year-olds in Europe? You probably don't know the number because I can guarantee you that Facebook doesn't either. <laughs> they have no idea. So how do they comply with the law? Uh, if you hate Facebook, Disney. Disney has the same issue. Um, you know, all Tons and tons of sites have a problem now. And so there was a lot of blowback. And uh, the EU, uh, the Article 29 um, Working Party, the group that drafted the GDPR, and if that name doesn't tell you everything about this regulation, uh, you, you might want to listen to it again. Article 29 Working Party. Yes, comrade. Um, so they uh, responded by saying, okay, we'll compromise. So we're going to leave the default age at 16, but we're going to let each country pick an age between under 16 and under 13. Now remember, there are 28 member states. So did they all pick the same age? Of course not. Some picked under 16, some picked under 15, some picked under 14, and some picked under 13. So if you have a website, how do you deal with this? Or an app. How do you go ahead and figure out, you know, how are you going to screen for this? How are you going to comply? What if the kids lie about their age? What if, you know, there's just a host of questions that the GDPR just doesn't even answer. And so when you get through each of these layers of complex, uh, you know, complex uh uh, layering, it, it's you end up with a regulation over privacy of all things that is just so uh, draconian that the cost of compliance. I mean, there are companies out there that spend many millions of dollars trying to comply with this thing. And you know, when us lawyers get together in a bar uh, and you start talking after a couple of drinks, they don't even know if they're in compliance because it's 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 extremely complex. Uh, and so, you know, just earlier this week, as I'm recording this, Google was just fined $57 million for violating the GDPR. Um, you know, <laughs> welcome to Europe. So what does this have to do with the splinter net? Well, you can see the difference in the burden in the EU versus the US. And so if you have US companies, particularly smaller companies, um, the question then becomes, do you want to be in the EU market? And it's not so much an, a question of your mission or your desire. It's usually a question of money. So if you're generating 200 sales a year out of the EU and you're generating revenues of, I don't know, let's say it's 50 bucks each, so 10 grand. And it costs you 15 grand to comply for your, your site, your little e-commerce site, plus the aggravation of dealing with it because it always has to be updated. You're always updating um, your compliance. You're always updating your data maps and all these different requirements. And do you want to risk being fined uh, for failing to comply? Because most insurance companies are not going to cover the fines, by the way. Um, and the answer quite often is no. And so whatever services, goods, or information uh, that those, those smaller businesses are responsible for online are going to be blocked from the EU. That's the response. You block the traffic from the EU. And you may be thinking, eh, e-commerce site, who cares? Okay, well, let's look at a bigger situation. So when the GDPR went into effect on May 25th, 2018, and you were in Berlin, London, Rome, Paris, anywhere in the EU, if you tried to pull up one of the biggest newspapers in the world, the Los Angeles Times, you got a page that said, I'm sorry, we don't serve content to your area. About 100 plus newspapers in the United States made the decision that it was economically uh, more viable to simply block EU traffic uh, than it was to try to comply with the GDPR. And that is the systematic uh, limiting of the flow of information around the world. Utopians got very upset stomachs. 
Uh, and so it's you know problematic to say the least. And uh, that's not the first instance of this. It will not be the last. We're seeing you know plenty more situations. And so ultimately, what's going to happen is as years pass, you're going to see more of this division based on these rules and regulations. The EU is considering a copyright regulation right now that is just a bruiser. Uh, and we're hearing rumblings from some of the bigger companies that they may pull certain aspects of their services out of the EU because of it. And these are big, big companies, some that start with G, who have massive resources. And if they're considering doing that, what are us little peasants going to do? <laughs> so, so it becomes a problem. Uh, and so that's why I have the last uh, entry in there, honey, I hate the neighbors, uh, because you're going to see companies, you know, potentially being forced to focus on specific targeted markets. And again, what about the flow of information? Well, the information flows across the internet because of private companies. Facebook is a private company. Twitter is a private company. And if they make a decision to leave a market, well, they can leave that market. They don't have any duty to be everywhere. Uh, and so the, the fear is that as we move forward, we're going to see more and more and more of that. And so that's going to be problematic. So that's the end of my rant for today. What is the splinter net? Uh, unfortunately, it's the division of the internet and it's something that we're seeing right now. I'm going to create a playlist uh, on our page. If you go to YouTube, look under our playlist, you'll see one for splinter net and I'll start posting videos on specific acts where you can see the splinter net in action. And in fact, as I just mentioned, we have some uh, breaking news on uh, Google, some considerations it's had about uh, taking some of its services out of Europe. So that'll be the next video. Uh, but keep an eye on it over the time, and you'll see you know, other companies doing that um, and see how it kind of starts evolving. And then with your business, you need to think about, well, how does this potentially affect me? What markets do I want to focus on? You know, Are there any particular concerns here? Um, so consider subscribing to the channel so you can get those videos. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, post them below. I'll be happy to answer them. If you enjoyed the video, uh, please give us a thumbs up. If you didn't enjoy the video, hey, look, a bird. Uh, no, you can give us a thumbs down as well. Uh, so anyways, again, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Have yourselves a good one.